start. So, I, I think most of you already take the first lab, right? So how, how do you think? Is it good? Everything easy to follow or is, uh, hard to follow? Easy, right? I guess, I guess it's quite clear because uh, TA already making everything well prepared. Even for those who are taking sick leave, you can still catching up by uh, watch the videos, and also do things by yourself. I hope everything's good, okay? And we'll do the same thing for this week and the coming week. And there's a, there's a little bit update about the schedule. Uh, as well, I'm not sure what I announced it to you guys or not, uh, because we still are in the phase of a final confirmation. Uh, for some reason, we need to shift uh, the lab of week nine to week six. So basically, we have week six, seven, eight. There are labs. All happens before the Easter break. And after that, you will have some time to uh, complete your coursework about CFD. And also, there is a chance, like the live lecture in week six is moving to some other time. Uh, because uh, uh, our co-lecture, he have some of the uh, 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 medical clinic appointment and operation, small operation done before that. So probably there's some chance we're able to uh, uh, move the, the time. So still not confirmed yet because we have a little bit difficulty to really booking this lecture theater in week 10. So probably we will making all those announcements later on the blackboard after everything's confirmed. So there's I just let you know there's a chance we, we have some uh, rearrangement about CFD part, okay? And today let's continue to learn the final element analysis part. And in the first part of today's lecture, I'm going to teach you something about uh, how to say, do a little bit of post process. So it turns out you're able to un understand what really happens inside of the structure. Although until now, we only are trying to uh, using force and displacement and element stiffness matrix and system stiffness matrix to kind of find out the relationship between the force and displacement, right? But only have the displacement that's not directly giving you the information what you need for the mechanical judgment or the design judgment. And so we need to go through a few steps, which is called the poster processing. And after we do this uh, poster processing steps, we're able to uh, detect whether this structure is going to be failed or not, based on so-called failure criteria. And we, using structure analysis as an example, and you are going to practice those uh, 2D FEA analysis by software, but we still need to somehow convert those uh, 2D FEA analysis results back into the failure criteria which we can apply the to structures and apply the to any other mechanical part. And then that's just going to learn today as well, how you're able to convert those uh, 2D results into a failure criteria. And then we, I will introduce a little bit 
something more about how this uh, final item analysis is going to be used in. Uh, I'm going to using uh, two projects as example to demonstrate today. One project comes from uh, individual projects uh, of MACE, which is uh, one of my students doing using FEA trying to uh, reduce the weight of a uh, of a mechanical part. And then the other the other project I want to share with you is like uh, a 3D project which is related to 3D printing and how the, the FEA is going to drive the so-called generative design, automatically change the design by a computer program, something like that. I hope uh, we can finish on time. There's a little bit more today of content. And then again, so the, this is always the picture I want to share with you at the beginning of every week's lecture. It's like, we do the analysis. We're trying to use the mathematical formula to relate those uh, uh, real-world problem into a linear equation. So we are trying to solve in this linear equation and to determine the structure deformation, right? So why is it deformation? Because every node has a certain kind of variation of their uh, displacement. If every node has the same displacement, that means what? The whole structure is not deformed at all, right? Every node applies the same displacement. There's no deformation. So what we are going to learn today is like, how are we going to using the difference between this uh, displacement and then trying to calculate in the deformation which is already uh, embedded into uh, the structure, okay? So the purpose of a process processing, as what I mentioned, is like we need to convert what we calculated. So far, you only practice the displacement and the force. And then we only need to using this displacement to convert into some of the more meaningful engineering parameters or values, which can be used to help you make the judgment for your design or change your design or improve your design. Somehow it's like you may uh, also did a little bit about inverse designs like, okay, this is uh, the failure criteria what I have. What is the maximum load you are allowed on this structure? So this is kind of an inverse problem which can also be helped solved by the process processing. So basically, the output from process processing usually is kind to confirm, convert those uh, geometric information in terms of displacement into a stress and strength, right? So basically, according to the material course, what you learned, stress and strength are the major parameters you need to use for detect whether this uh, material or the structure is going to fail, okay? So let's look at the, the example. This is again a pin joint frame, and then which have a two, uh, which we have a two uh, bars here, and then linked by a pin, and then we apply the force. This is quite a standard and a simple kind of structure analysis, which you can already uh, solve it by yourself after the first two weeks learning, right? And then so to solve this problem, we somehow need to uh, go through the steps of a pre-processing solution, impose bounding condition, the solving linear equation. And now we are going to this stage to uh, apply the poster process to giving an interpretation of the result. Okay, so how are we going to interpret this result? It's pretty much based on, say, how are we able to convert them into stress and strength? how I'm going to, using this stress and strength according to the failure criteria to detect whether it's going to fail or not, okay? So here let's look at this example, like this is the structure we are going to solve, and then we already, by the knowledge of what we learned in the first two weeks, to establish a linear equation system which link the displacement to the force, right? So now it's like after we solving this uh, linear equation system, we're able to determine all those displacements on this node. And then we are also able to determine what is the force which we received on, uh, at node two and node three. So this is something we already done. And then the thing is like, here I'm uh, going to ask you the question is like, will this structure fail? And then what is the maximum safe load? for this structure. Can we answer these questions? And how are we able to convert the displacement 
into some uh, meaningful value, we can answer these questions. So this is basically what I'm going to cover in the coming 10 minutes. Okay. So how are we going to deal with these things? So let's consider about we already have the displacement, which is already determined according to the linear system, which I showed in the previous slide. Right? Now say we have those unloaded node coordinates. So we have the node coordinate of node 1, 2, 3 before we apply the force. And then we also have the loaded node coordinate after we apply the force. How we obtain this? Because we have the displacement. So we're using the original coordinate plus the displacement. We're going to obtain its current coordinate. Right? Well, every node we're using the previous coordinate plus the displacement, we're able to obtain its current uh, coordinate. So, uh, oh, my, my color has is it better now? Okay. So now we are, we are able to use in this uh, difference between the coordinate before loading and after loading. So, what are you going to calculate is like, Basically, because this is 1D element, so all the thing what I would like to apply here is like I'm trying to study what is the length variation of all these bars. So according to this, we're able to find out the original length. Maybe I should use this side better. So for, for the original length, we're going to using its original coordinate to calculating. So we have the element one and the element two. This is our original length, right? So the same thing, like we're going to using the new coordinate of the node after loading to calculating its current length after loading, right? So, and then we have this length and this length for the same two elements. So after that, we're able to convert them into strength, right? So strength basically is, is, it says like the length difference divided by its original length. So that gives you the strength of these two elements. So for element one, we have this strength, and element two, we have another strength, okay? And then we are going to apply the linear material here. So because the linear material, the so basic strength and strength are linked by the Young's modulars. So we are using the Young's modulars of this, uh, using Young's modulars of this uh, uh, bar. It's like material-oriented modulars times the strength of, so this is the strength of the bar times the Young's modulars. So we have is a current stress, right, after loading. So it's quite, Straightforward calculation, I guess, is simple. And then things like we have this uh, stress-based uh, solution, and uh, how are we going to using this to answer the previous questions? The so question one is like, is this structure going to fail? And the second question is like, what is the maximum load which is allowed to apply there? Okay. So let's look looking at uh, the first question. It's like, will this structure fail? And then how are we able to know this? It's based uh, really on a kind of a material test, right? So we are using the uh, so-called the standard material testing system, which is ADMTS, MET, sorry. So uh, this is, I'm not sure whether you do this by yourself or not, or, but at least you watched the video before. So it goes through the whole process, it's like we're using our uh, some of the length meters to really attach to with the uh, spaceman, and then we really pull it to use the force. So it turns out we measure the force and the length variation at the same time. So basically, you're able to obtain a stress and strength curve, right? And then the slope of this curve actually gives you the Young's modulus of, of, of this material. So this is the space where you place it there and you attach some of the, uh, the, the, the distance meters there. So this the distance meter is trying to catch the length variation on the two, say, fixtures, between these two fixtures which you attach on the, on the specimen. After you remove this, 
you probably go into the, the stage where the material is going to have a plastic deformation. So this is, so I'm not sure whether you learn this or not. So I suppose you learn this, and there is an elastic deformation phase, and there is also a plastic deformation phase, right? So for elastic deformation phase, that means like after you unload the force, and probably the material will able to somehow comes back to its original shape. And then the plastic means like even after you unload it, it's still deformed, it will never come back again. So that's called plastic deformation. So basically, because we only learn the linear FEA here, so we can only model those linear elastic deformation by the software what we use right now, okay? So this is the whole process. So after you calculating this, at least you know a few parameters. It's like what is the Young's modulus, which is the slope of those, uh, say, stress and strain curve, right? And then what is the, the failure case? It's like which, which stress, or which, which, which strain this material is going to fail because it's like it started to broken or it started to have a plastic deformation. So those are the points we need to measure. So at least we know like what is the maximum, what is the maximum stress which this material can sustain during this kind of, uh, say, tensile test, right? So this is uh, what we learned from this experiment. And then now we are going to apply this. So question one, will this structure fail? So as what you can see, like as shown on the simulation, it's like starting to have a bigger and a bigger uh, kind of uh, displacement of deformation, and then a bigger and a bigger stress is going to have inside of this basement, right? So if we have the tested safe stress, which is like maximum stress this material can sustain during this tensile testing, and then if our current result of the maximum stress inside of the whole structure is less than the tester stress, maximum stress, and then that means this structure is not going to fail, right? So this is quite easy to understand. This one D case is quite simple. And then second question is like, what is the maximum safe load for this structure? In general, this is something is harder to answer if we consider about a nonlinear deformation inside of the structure because we need to try different kind of loading and see whether it's going to fail or not. And then this is not also not easy to answer if we have a very complicated structure, have uh, many uh, components, different materials put inside. This is also not easy to answer. So turns out you need to somehow written the program or do trial and error, try to apply different loading and obtain its result of the post-processing of FEA and try to see whether it's going to fail or not. But for this particular case, because it's uh, so simple, it's a linear relationship, right? So see, everything what we obtain is a kind of linearly related to the force and the displacement. Because of this uh, linear property, and we're able to answer this question directly. So as what I mentioned here, it's like it's a linear result. So basically the result is uh, scalable. We are able to using the maximum allowed stress and then the current stress to find out the, r the ratio between the maximum allowed stress and the current stress. And then we're using this ratio to times the current force. So that is the linear relationship, right? So we're able to find out what is the allowed maximum force applied on this structure. But only have this is not safe enough because we have not considered about the safety factors there. So for, for engineer, you need to apply a certain level of safety factors. More aggressive, you can use in point, one point something, 1.1, 1 1.2. 1 .1, this is a quite aggressive decision. But more conservative, you can make it more bigger safety factors like five times or three times, okay? But here, let's say the safety factor is two, okay? And if the safety factor is two, so basically the maximum force needs to be divided by this safety factor. 
So we have the quite safe maximum force, which can be applied here. Okay. So this gives you the answer of the two first two questions. So far, so good. Any questions? Okay. All right. So let's move forward. So. 1D case is quite simple because it's basically we're calculating the, the stress in every elements and then we find out the maximum one and we compare this maximum, maximum one with the allowed or safety maximum stress which is we tested from those tensile tests. But the 2D case is a little bit more challenging because as you watch from the video, like the 2D elements basically you have something like you, you're able to obtain the stress along multiple directions. So you have a stress, the, the normal stress along the, this plane, I mean perpendicular to this plane, this is normal stress, and then this is normal stress along the, the y direction, and the, besides of those normal stress, you also have the shear stress, right? So you have the shear stress which is on the surface. So let's say if a local 2D material and then you have x, sigma x, six y, sigma y, that's is a stress along x direction, stress along y direction. You also have a, a tau x, y, which is gives you the shearing stress. Of course, the shearing stress on two uh, neighboring plants, they are equal to each other, but have a perpendicular direction, right? So the thing is like, how are we get able to obtain this stress? And to using this stress to uh, calculating whether the structure is going to fail or not. Okay, obtain this stress, we can obtain, seek the help of our final element analysis software, but the final decision still comes to you. So we need to convert this three stress into a direction which have only normal stress and thus no shearing stress. So we need to convert this stress into the so-called principal stress, right? So how are we able to calculate in the principal stresses? The very, I mean, geometric solution. So there's a geometric solution and then there's also linear algebra solution. So here I would like to introduce the geometric solution which is more easy to understand. It's like if we have this stress as sigma x, and this is stress as a sigma y, and then this is stress as a tau xy. So we are able to, first of all, define one point according to sigma x and uh, minus tau xy. Okay, if this horizontal axis is the axis of uh, sigma, and then the vertical axis is axis of tau. So, and then we have a one point which is defined according to sigma x and the tau minus tau xy. And then at the same time, we are able to define another point on the other side of the tau axis, uh, on the sigma axis, sorry. And so this is the other point which is the sigma y and tau xy, okay? So now we have these two points which is able to be easily defined. And then according to, based on these two points, we draw a line between them. And then here the C gives you the intersection point between this line and the sigma axis. Okay? So this point coordinate is actually half of sigma x plus sigma y. Right? And the, the tau direction is actually this is minus tau plus a tau, this gives you zero, okay? It's quite simple to obtain this C coordinate. So this C coordinate is half of the sigma x plus sigma y and zero. And then using this, we are able to somehow draw a circle, okay? Using half of the distance between this point and this point as the radius, we are able to draw a circle. So this circle is a core more circle, okay? Why is it more circle? This is because every point on this circle actually gives you one status of the local 
material stress and strain, uh, stress and uh, normal stress and shearing stress, by just like simply you rotate the local cube. Okay, so it's like you travel on this circle, similar to like you locally rotated this cube. I mean, you you extract a rotated cube out. The material itself, the structure itself, is not rotate. Just like how you interpret the local, the local uh, uh, stress and the the shearing stress. Okay, so turns out you can you are able to find out the two extreme point. So on this point and this point, which is gives you one nice property is like there's no shearing force at all. There's no shearing stress at all on these two points because tau equal to zero, right? So for every local material, you are able to find out two status, which is actually gives you like, we can simply call it, this is the maximum stress, and then this is the minimum stress of the local situation. So that's why it's called the principal stress, because in this principal direction, and then all those uh, shearing stress just gone, disappear. You only have a normal stress. Okay. So, so far so good, right? This is the geometric interpretation, which is easy to calculate. Linear algebra solution is like you're applying the so-called eigenvector decomposition or eigenvalue decomposition or for two by two matrix you're able to also obtain two value, which is equal to sigma, sigma A and sigma B. I'm not sure whether eigenvalue decomposition is covered by a linear algebra course. If it is, nice. If it's not, it doesn't matter, because eigenvector decomposition actually do the similar thing as the geometric interpretation here, but all happened in the linear vector space, okay? So the same correspondence relationship. And so that means this maximum stress is able to be calculated either by writing a simple program to using this geometry solution or just directly call a linear algebra library to find out the eigenvalue and eigenvectors. So that is gives you the answer, the same answer. Okay? So now the thing is like how are we able to uh, apply the failure criteria? So failure criteria is different if we are facing different material. So let's consider about a simple type of material, which is so-called uh, the brittle material, which including the glass, ceramic, and graphite, and all this kind of uh, uh, material. So basically, they only have a very low plastic deformation. So or they have only allow a very small number of elastic deformation as well, or nearly no elastic deformation. So in this scenario, so we simply detect what is the, say, the maximum allowed tensile stress, and then what is the maximum allowed compressed stress. Okay, so we have, so you see like sigma t, t tends for tensile, and uh, sigma c means like uh, compressed. So you do the same testing by those uh, original shown in the video, this kind of material test. You tensile and pull it and compress it. And then you have a sigma t and a sigma c, which can be obtained. And then the failure criteria of this particular material is like, if both of those principal stress, which you obtained from this point and this point, are happens between sigma t and minus sigma, sigma c, and then that gives you the safe criteria, okay? If any of this value, sigma, sigma 1, sigma 2, which is uh, beyond this uh, scope, and then that means this uh, material is going to fail, okay? So far so good, right? And then things become some more complicated if we have, a, say, a ductile material, which is widely used, it's like the metals, those are things, and rubbers, rubbers is slightly different, and the silicon is more challenging because it's hyper-elastic. And let's just think, 
consider about those uh, ductile kind of material, which is widely used in many of the mechanical engineering designs. And then you need to, using the principal stress, and then convert them into a kind of uh, von Mises stress. Okay? So for those of von Mises stress, you need somehow using one of this. Let's look at this in general. So basically, all this, this is gives you the 3D case. Okay? So 3D case, you have a normal stress along x direction, y direction, z direction. So this is actually equal to sigma x, x, sigma y, y, sigma y, y, sigma z, z, okay? And sigma z, z, and sigma x, x. And then this just actually give you the shearing, the shearing force, which is like what happens on, on, the, on the plan, which is defined by x, y, and what happens on the plan, which is defined by uh, the plan uh, uh, y, z, and z, x. And then, so basically, as long as you're able to find out the stresses, normal stress along x, y, z directions, and then also the shearing, shearing stress on three phases, you're able to convert them into a so-called von Mises stress, okay? So for different material, you can quickly check in what is the, the failure criteria of a von Mises stress. And then if the current von Mises stress is less than the maximum allowed von Mises stress, and then that means it's safe, okay? So I guess this is something that's going to be covered by other courses, it's not this course. So basically this course just gives you like how you convert those uh, final animal analysis results into the von Mises stress, which is help you to make the decision. So this is, all what we, we can obtain after we do the final animal analysis, okay? Any questions? So far so good, right? So the thing comes out, it's like, is the simulation <laughs> correct? So I have to say like, every simulation is wrong. That's why it's a core simulation. And as what I've shown here, all the forecasts are wrong. Some forecasts are even worse than the others. So now here comes the problem. How do you know your simulation is better than the others? So here's a quite a challenging issue you need, to re you need to answer at the end of the simulation. And then usually you need to either using like an analytical calculations judgment if like like my simulation is go to the right trend of what I predicted by the analytical calculation, or does it really make sense according to my engineering background? So this is the first thing you, you could try to uh, verify whether your simulation is correct or not. And then the second thing, of course, is more important. You're building a prototype, and you really test it on the prototype and to see whether it's correct or not. But nowadays, people are trying to somehow reduce the step of a prototyping and then trying to make simulation more and more accurate. And then that is uh, something you need to, to understand. It really depends on the resolution of your calculation. Okay, so everything is based on your resolution. So if you are trying to have a more accurate result, probably you need to using a higher resolution in your mesh, or more nodes, which is using in your uh, tessellation. And then that really depends on what is the, what is the appropriate mesh resolution. 
So here just shows a one example about like the result of what you applied, what you can you can obtain by applying different mesh resolution. So starting from a very coarse mesh resolution and a better mesh resolution, and then even further refine the mesh. And then if that is the if we know the ground truth, if we already know what is the ground truth, and then you can find like when you have a more and more mesh involved in the calculation, more and more nodes, so it's kind of so-called converged to that ground truth, right? So the thing is like, is it the more the better? No. What is the problem if you have a more mesh? The, yeah, the very straightforward uh, result is like it's more time consuming. Like you're using out the memory, you're using out a, a kind of a, like the computer, computing resources, small time is need, and then so it turns out prediction becomes not a prediction, but so, because for example, if you calculate a forecast prediction, it takes about a whole week to have the result. Is that a forecast anymore? No, right? It's just a verification of a numerical calculation. So the thing is like you need to always find out the balance, the trade-off between the speed and the accuracy you want to achieve. And also, there's another problem. It's like when you have a more and more mesh involved there, the distance between two nodes becomes a smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Let's say consider about how we're calculating the strand just now. If you're looking at the, the method we're calculating the strand here, it basically depends on the length variation over the by the length, right? So if you are familiar with a computer program, you can predict what happens if my L1 is a very, very small number. What's going to happen? If L1 is a very, very small number, that means there is a large, relatively very big truncation arrow embedded into L1, right? Because there is the smallest number that can be stored by a computer variable. Let's say if you're using float, like a simple, a single decimal representation, the minimum value you can represent is 10 power to the minus 5. Okay? And then if let's see if L1 is a sum of value which is very small, nearly 10 power to by minus 5. And then all after that, it's like 0, 0, 0, 1, and all the rest numbers actually are thrown away by a computer, right? So all those are so-called truncation error, because we truncated here, truncation error. So if you truncation error, that gives you what is the number represented by L1, and what is the real number it should be. So there is an error embedded there. Now it turns out like your strand is sum of value divided by this error, which have a truncation error. So somehow like you amplify the truncation error, right? So if your L1 becomes very, very small, turns out the truncation error dominate the whole thing. The prediction start to get wrong. So that is very important. So you, it's, it's never the, the, the more the better. So it really depends on how you kind of consider about the error represented by a computer program and the calculation, how this is, calculation is going to amplify this error or is make it smaller and smaller. So this is very important. So here gives you just one example, like when the distance between two neighboring nodes is not too small. Of course, in this scenario, if you refine the mesh, you probably have more accurate result. Of course, the cost is like you spend more time in, in the simulation. Okay? So that's all about the, the validation and converge things. And any questions? If no question, let's uh, have a short break for five minutes, and then we'll come back to the part of uh, how we are going to using our FEA's result to 
supervise some of the design problems. Okay. Yeah, you can also do by MATLAB first and then use a hand to substitute it back and to write it. Okay, thank you very much. Who? Okay, and uh, the battery become uh, red again. I'm not sure how long this uh, battery can sustain, but let's continue. <laughs> so, um, yeah, how are we go able to using those uh, finite analysis uh, in uh, design? For example, uh, my major is a design manufacturing, so 
I think it's, uh, it's very important to see like how fine element analysis helps you generate design by a program. So this is a very important concept nowadays, which is uh, widely accepted by the industry. That's the future of engineering design, so-called generative design. It's like write a program or using uh, artificial intelligence core to really generate new design instead of uh, like simply using human engineers like do trial and error. So basically let the computer do the trial and error. Let's simply say in this way. So here's just uh, some of the example of the new design, which is all calculating and generated by a computer program. It's like it's widely realized by a kind of 3D printing technology. So it's pretty much you, you can see this is a, a kind of a, a, a prosthetic hand, which is a, a 3D printed, the whole structure. And then this, uh, this shoes are very nice because it's not that it looks nice. It's like it's really lightweight. And then it's a kind of a generate a design mechanically strong, but lightweight, okay? And then here, just some other result, which is using a CFD simulation to drive the design. So basically, it's generate a new design according to the simulation. So basically, the concept, what I want to deliver today is like, simulation is very important to serve as a core to optimize the design. So basically, you are able to use in simulation to change your design automatically by a program. So let's see a little bit about why we need to do this. This is because when we consider about the capability which is provided by uh, additive manufacturing, which is also called 3D printing, you are able to make the structure inside very, very complicated. Okay? So the things like how are you able to uh, generate those very complicated things well, nowadays, there's many of the tools are available you can, you can assess online, just like give you some different patterns. So whether you're going to apply this pattern into the infill or that pattern, it's all based on heuristic decisions at this moment. Okay? If you don't apply the new method, so-called uh, generative design. So the problem is like, it's have a limited type of a pattern, and usually people make a decision in a trial and error manner. It's like you try different uh, patterns and see what is optimized, which is fine, but it's not optimized, right? So the things like what we would like to achieve with the help of the simulation nowadays is like we need to somehow make it automatically conduct evolution of a design insight of a program. Okay. So here gives you a very typical question of generative design, which is also called topology optimization, okay? So let's say I'm going to design a cantilever beam, and then we have uh, these blocks are the possibility where you place the material. Now I only allow you to give a maximum 60 block filled with the material. And how are you able to find out this kind of uh, distribution of a material inside. So this is the general problem of uh, generative design, which is pretty much like give you a whole box of uh, Lego blocks. And then where are you going to place these Lego blocks? So it turns out you find out uh, optimized cantilever beam, which is only using 60, but very, very strong. Okay? So the thing, the problem to be solved the search space is super huge. Let's see how huge it is. So basically, in X direction, you have 20 possibilities. And then the Y direction, you have 10 possibilities. So in total, there is around 200 places allow you to place these 60 blocks, right? So number of possibility of designs, actually, it's like you select 60 out of those 200. Right? This is a combination problem. So the possible design is actually this number, which is super huge. So it turns out even using computer program, you cannot do the brute force check. So basically you cannot say, okay, I try different kind of combination by a computer. So you need to have a way to really drive the program to somehow converge to the possible solution. So of course, this is one possible solution, A. 
And then this gives you another possible solution B. And then this is gives you the solution which is computed by a program using FEA in the core. Okay? So the thing you find like this distort shape actually gives you the real deformation of this cantilever beam if you apply the same force. Okay, so you can find like design C turns out becomes much more stiff compared to other two designs, right? So how are we able to have this? And you don't need to understand the mathematics here, but the thing is like you, you need to understand the pipeline. It's like in this pipeline, we define some of the energy, which is so-called the strain energy, which is basically according to the displacement on every node. Okay, so U just gives you the displacement on every node, and K rho, K rho actually gives you a stiffness matrix, which according to where you place those materials. So for those for those position, if you're putting a material there, so you're making the density of this block be one, and then if you say, I'm choosing to make it here a cavity, so you're making the density a very, very small number. Why we don't put zero there? Because we are trying to avoid the singularity generated by linear sulfur. Okay? So we're just using 10 power by minus five or 10 power by minus three, and putting at the minimum density. So here just uh, this formula is just a 2D version of the strand energy applied on a spring. So spring is 1D problem, okay? So if you have a spring, you have a force. So basically your strand energy is equal to half of a K times square of U, right? So that is your strand energy on the spring. And then here we apply calculating strand energy on the whole system. So based on that, now we are trying to somehow solving where the row should be placed. Okay, where the row is zero, where the row is one. This will go through a kind of iteration. So basically, you can find like inside of this iteration, the first step is always trying to solving this displacement and force relationship. Right, so this is actually FEA. So FEA is here, okay? So as a result of FEA, you are able to calculate the elastic energy, which is based on the formulation of this. And then based on the elastic energy, you can find like, if I remove this material here, and what will be the energy change? So that is called sensitivity analysis. How quickly this energy is going to be changed if I remove here? So if you try here and here and here. So basically, you're able to find out the gradient of the energy related to the density. Okay? So we only remove material from those regions. This gradient is very, very small. That means what? That means even if I remove the material from here, the strain energy is not going to change too far, too much, right? So that is some of things, some of places, the material is less important. So let's look at the situation here. So all these white regions shown on this example are less important because if we remove there, it's not going to change the, the strain energy too much. And also, we find out an interesting phenomenon. The calculation result of this routine, the distribution of material which remains actually following the principal stress direction. Okay? So principal stress direction gives you a very important distribution or very important idea like where those materials should be located, where material need to sustain there. Okay? So that's uh, the process of uh, topology optimization. So now you can see, here shows another example if you're applying two loading on the implant, which is going to be 3D printed and put inside of a human being to have, it's like a, a, a man-made joint or something like that, hip joint. And then this is lightweight. And then here shows like where those material should be 
tipped if you're trying to reduce the weight. Okay. So in one of my individual projects, I asked a student to do a project trying to use the same concept, but do not need to really write the program. You can even do this, applying the same concept by yourself. So personally, uh, the student serves as a computer program, but run simulation using the previous routine, like the sensitivity of the analysis. So what they did is like, wish to reduce the part, the weight of a car part, okay? And then this is uh, highlight the orange part. This is a multiple component. So the thing, what he did is like, okay, let's try to start from the first mesh. And then we have the first mesh, we apply the loading, and then we find out the distribution of the strand, right? So according to the distribution of the strand, you are able to identify where strand is more important. The, I mean, those regions where have a large strand are those regions which is very important, right? For those regions which have a very less small strand or small stress, those are the regions which is allowed to remove. So according to that, the first the reiteration here, find out the distribution and remove this part and this part. Okay. And then based on this, they run the simulation again. And according to the simulation, it's allowed you to further remove material. Right? So he removed this part and some other small parts. And then keep in doing this. You are able to remove more and more material, but still trying to maximize those uh, stiffness of the whole structure. Okay, so this is the basic idea. So in total, if you consider about the actual weight, here shows the original weight, like, like 30, 33 kilogram. And then after we're doing this, now we, are, we already reduce almost by one third, right? We can keep in doing that and then further reduce. So let's say stop at 60% of the original weight. Reduce the weight by 30% is already a very significant improvement of the weight. Let's say he did this for the other one, for this one, and you can see like the original design is 26, and then you can further reduce the weight in this way. So nowadays we're talking a lot of uh, a net zero kind of uh, energy consumption. I believe this is the right direction for everybody here to go. It's like in your design, always trying to bring in this concept, keeping the original stiffness you have a large space which can help you to reduce the, the weight by applying this kind of a technology, okay? So, but something challenging is like, consider about the car part. It's really fabricated, most of the cases fabricated by die casting, okay? Not every shape can be easily fabricated by die casting, right? So, during this, update, you should always bring in mind the manufacturing constraints. So what are the shapes which can be fabricated by your current manufacturing means? For example, die casting. So they never generate some of shape which is harder to be fabricated by die casting. So this is something you can detect by your uh, either other software or by your personal judgment. Is this shape able to be uh, uh, fabricated by the existing manufacturing means or it's not. So this is some concept called manufacturing insured, manufacturability insured generative design, which is also very important, okay? So basically my understanding, my, the information I would like to deliver here is like FEA-based topology information, topology optimization or generative design is really a very, very effective way to help you to reduce the weight of parts, okay? But the thing is like, most challenging part, again, as what I've shown before, all the simulation is mesh dependent, right? So when the student try to use in a different mesh resolution to conduct the same practice, you probably can have a totally different result, okay? So existing challenge issue is like, still mesh dependent, and the second thing is like, FEA is really time consuming. It is time consuming, although, or what do you practice, the small scale problem is okay. But when you go to huge problem, FEA simulation is very 
time consuming, and how are we able to reduce the weight? I mean, reduce the time of calculation. It really depends on judgment, and may, may also using a more powerful algorithms, just like some of the uh, uh, FEA can run in on parallel computer, so basically you can use in PC cluster or even using GPU to speed up the calculation, and all these are, are things you need to consider. And then the last thing is very, very important is about manufacturing constraints. So how are we able to consider the manufacturing constraints while you are trying to optimize the design, which is very important, okay? So here shows like when you're using the same parts, when you're using different mesh, so eventually the same routine gives you a total different result. Okay, so this is still some challenging need to be a software nowadays. Okay. And consider about the last constraint, last uh, challenging issue is about the manufacturability. A lot of people say, okay, don't worry about it. Let's say simply using 3D printing. And there are two issues here. It's like, first of all, you cannot 3D print anything, right? And why you cannot 3D print anything? Well, there are two issues as well. First of all, 3D printing process is very uh, expensive. The same part, the same metal part, you 3D print it, <coughs> you're, or you're fabricated by like sand casting, let's say sand casting. The cost is almost 10 times, or even more than that. And not talking about 3D printing is also very slow. Right? Nowadays, 3D printing is not fast enough. Okay. And the third issue is like the quality of 3D printing model. I mean, the stiffness, the strength of the 3D printing model still not reach the level of conventional manufacturing yet at this moment. So in those days, 3D printing is only used in a quite limited places. Just like one place is like, I really, really want to generate a kind of a high, a structure with a high porosity. Okay, I, I know some of you guys are from uh, aerospace engineering. High porosity structure plays a very, very important role in many scenarios. If you want to consider about the thermal, if you want to consider about those uh, biomedical applications, like how the um, tissues can, can really go inside of an implant and really have a very tight binding between the human being and the implant inside of the, like, the man-made the hip joint have suffered a lot of this problem. So, turns out in those scenarios, you need to really 3D print this kind of a porosity system, porosity uh, uh, parts with a high porosity. And then, so this is something you need to consider. But even for 3D printing, they also have some of the problem of manufacturability. Like, the general idea of a 3D printing is just like you accumulate the material layer by layer, right? So that's how it's called 3D printing. So think about some shape like this. I print all the layers to here, and then when I reach this layer, this generate a large overhang, right? So, if you want to print this large overhead, the 3D printing technology needs to generate a so-called supporting structures below this overhead. Okay. Now the issue is like, if the supporting structure happens outside of a model, you can somehow use the poster process to remove them. But if you are trying to 3D print some of this uh, structure with a high porosity, like what's shown here, those are supporting structures already go inside, right? It's a very complicated structure inside. How are you able to remove them? There's no way for you to remove them unless you're not applying metal here, unless you're using polymer. So basically, there are some way like you print in the solid mode by one type of polymer, the supporting structure by another type of polymer, which is water solvable. So after you 3D printing, put it in, inside of uh, some special liquid to somehow melt those supporting structures. That's possible, but for metal 3D printing, this is an essential problem to be solved. Okay? So the thing is like, how are we able to really solving this problem by, by using a so-called 
a special design, which is at the same time apply this in the routine of a, a, a FEA-based simulation or FEA-based uh, optimization. So there's a, a relative kind of a tricky solution, actually divided by, by, my, by my research group. It's like we, we somehow define a kind of a rhombic structure. Okay? So if you find out like the rhombic structure, you probably generate a kind of a self-supported structure. So it's basically for different material, it's always have a certain level of a so-called self-supporting angle. Okay? So for, for metal, the self-supporting angle is, for example, 70 degree. For polymer, it could be a 40 degree. Okay? The more aggressively using high viscosity material, you probably can make the, the, the supporting angle smaller and smaller. But no matter how, there's some material-related supporting angle embedded in the 3D printing. Okay? So let's say we somehow de define a rhombic structure which is self-supported. And the angle is determined according to this material. And now we are inserting, insert this kind of uh, rhombic structures inside of the solid and trying to reduce the weight. Okay? So by using the routine, what I introduced just now. So here shows a one a bunny example. And then it's like, I want to insert rhombic structure inside. And then if this is the force, so I adaptively somehow find out where is, uh, uh, where is uh, less important. So basically, we remove those material in those rhombic regions. Okay? So this is the basic idea. So again, we're using the FEA to calculating the elasticity and the calculating the strand distribution. And according to the strand distribution, we're using the energy, which I introduced before, the so-called stiffness energy, strand energy, trying to evaluate its sensitivity. Where is uh, less sensitive, where is more sensitive, okay? So what is the concept of sensitivity? Sensitivity is just like you have a machine, okay? And then you have some of parameters to tune this machine. Now the thing is like, if you tune one button, you, if you print this button, it's like small change of this button, and then the outcome of this machine does not change. So that means the whole performance is less sensitive to this parameter, right? If you tune the other parameter slightly, the same amount, it's giving a huge change of the outcome of the machine. So that means the machine is more sensitive to this parameter. So for different parameters, you can locally tune them and to see how likely the outcome is going to change. The more significant change it gives you like the outcome is more sensitive to these parameters. And what this related gradient, right? This is gives you the gradient of the outcome related to the parameter. So gradient calculating by differentiation. So that's how we're able to they're using some of the formula. You don't need to go really understand what happens inside the but concept wise is like just calculating what happens if I remove the material here. If you remove this material here, if the energy changes too much, that means this local region is very, very sensitive right, to the whole performance. We only remove material in those regions which is less sensitive. Right? So that still keeps you a very good mechanical stiffness. So by applying that, so you can find like this is a now optimized, which is a, a weight of the original uh, volume. If we make it a complete solid, only 60%. This is somehow optimized. This is further optimized. So you can see, like, by using the uniform structure inside and the optimized structure inside, you can find, like, the deformation can be greatly reduced. And then this is also verified by a uh, say, physical test. For example, this is a, a bridge optimized by using the previous method. And this is a bridge not optimized We're using uniform infield structures. Both of these structures, they are consume the same material. 
create the same amount of material. Of course, fabrication-wise, it takes the same amount of time to fabricate. And then let's see, the first test happens by uh, applying the same force. I'm not sure whether you can see the, the screen here clearly. So we apply 62 Newton on the, as a force. Here the same, 62 Newton. But for the non-optimized one, it only gives you displacement about 2.1 millimeter. But for the optimized, uh, this is optimized one, it only gives you displacement for 2.1 millimeter. For the non-optimized one, it's actually this one, it gives you a very large displacement. So basically it means like it's very soft, right? It's not as stiff as the previous one. And then here shows like, what about if we apply the same displacement amount, like both of them apply three millimeters, but for this one, you need to have the force about 90 Newton. This is a very firm one. And then this one is or this original design, which is give you the force about, you only need to apply 58 Newton as a force, you're already able to achieve three millimeter displacement. So this gives you a basic idea about like, there's a lot of things you can do when you're using the same amount of material, right? Just to bring simulation in the loop, which then helps you to somehow generate a nice, very nice distribution about what you are able to achieve by, here I'm only using the uh, strain energy as an objective to be optimized, of course, you can use other objectives. For example, your aerospace project, you can use in either the flow speed or you can use in the, the ventilation system, the efficiency. If you are developing a, a, a new heating system, you can also use in the, the convention speed, right? So, so it's like all the things you can, as long as you are able to evaluate it directly based on the change of material allocation, you are able to using simulation in the loop to optimize your design. So that is a very, very important concept I would like to deliver here. This is somehow related to the following courses and also your individual projects. I, I, I see many of those chance you're able to use in simulation in the loop to change your design, okay? So any questions? So far so good? Let's come to, okay, the lab shade three is actually the lab which you, you need to conduct in this week. So as what I mentioned here, you need to solve a few problems. The first problem is the plan stress problem. So here I would like to ask you a question. What is the difference between the plan stress problem and the plan strain problem? In what scenario you are going to apply plan stress problem? In which geometry? It's very thin, right? Everything is very thin, and then you only apply the force in the plan, right? And what is the scenario you're going to apply the uh, stiffness matrix of a plan strain? It's a very, one dimension is very, large compared to other two dimensions. That's a scenario, right? So it's like the same cross section, but extremely long, and then the loading applied there, and then you can assume that all the strength only happens inside the plant, so that's a different thing, so okay. When you are trying to call an element, trying to make sure that you're choosing the right element, this is the very first, first thing, all, both core plant, but this plant is not that plant, so there's different plants. And then, so for problem one, you need to determine the stress and strain in a thin place. So trying to make sure that using the element which is a plan stress element instead of a plan strain element. So it's like this question is like a determined stress at a point, different point. So you need to make sure that you meshing contain point C. I'm pretty sure that your mesh will contain point no, that's not, not sure as well. So basically, mesh can really jump, right? The location of vertices can jump. So try to make sure, like, for those particular points, which is a critical point, you always have a, a vertex of the mesh placed there. That's very important, okay? 
So why I say that? This is because the uh, 2D calculation is the same as uh, as a 3D uh, as 1D. So let me use the visualizer to draw a little bit. Okay. So the 2D calculation. So this is 1D calculation. So basically, you calculating the value. It's like U1, V1, U2, V2. So you you basically calculating the displacement on this node and this node, right? So what if like I would like to understand one general point here? What is the value inside? It really depends. Um, what element you use? So all the elements, what you will learn in this course is a linear element. So why we call it a linear element? Because the general, for example, this is point x. So general, what is u x? What is v x inside? Is a kind of a linear interpolation between what happens on two nodes. Okay. So let's say if this distance. Compared to this distance, so L1, L2. So if this two distance gives you a value alpha, basically what U x gives you is based on linear interpolation between two points. So this is given by a linear interpolation, one minus alpha U1 plus alpha U2. Okay, so when alpha change from zero to one, so alpha's range between so alpha is between the value zero and one, right? So when alpha change from zero and one, it's actually this point traveled on here, right, on the bar. So this gives you a general formula how FEA. Give you the distribution because you're only calculating value on this node and this node. What happens in the middle is the based on linear interpolation. So the same thing is like v x is actually equal to one minus alpha v one plus alpha v two. So far so good, right? <coughs> Sorry. So this is one D problem. What about 2D? So 2D, let's see. In general, you have a mesh. You have a triangle. So everything again. If let's say, this is my node one. This is my node two. This is my node three. The displacement happens is like u1 v1, like u2. V2, and here we have U3, V3. Okay. So again, you're only calculating on the node. What are you are trying to obtain for one particular point inside? Let's say if this is x y, and then what is my The coordinate, if the coordinate of this one is x y, so what is this value and this value? Again, it's based on a bilinear interpolation among these three points inside. Okay, so how this is、uh, calculated? This is based on a kind of a so-called barycentric coordinate, and you can using this. To somehow divide the whole triangle into three small triangles. Okay. So for the region opposite to node one, we say this is area. If it's area of this one, the area of this one is a one. It can be calculated, right? So. For the region, I'm using another color. So for the region opposite to 
node 2. So this region is on the opposite side of node 1, so we call it A1. So this region is on the opposite of node 2, so we say it's A2. And then we could have the third region. Who? This color is not good. So we have the third region, which is uh, next to the opposite edge of node 3. So if this is called A3, so basically we have three areas, right? OK. Now if we have the total area of the original triangle as A, this is, let's say, A total. So here gives you very interesting numbers like alpha, beta, gamma. Alpha is equal to A1 over by A total. Beta equal to A2 A over by A total. Gamma equal to A3 over the by A total. Okay. And this alpha, beta, gamma gives you a very nice property as alpha plus, can you see it? Alpha plus beta plus gamma equal to 1, right? Right? It's for sure. Okay. And another very nice property is like you can now using alpha, beta, gamma to define the value of this node according to the value of this three as uh, maybe I can shift a little bit. Okay. So this can be defined as u x y. X y gives you the posi X y gives you the position of this point, right? The position of all this are somehow already fixed, right? Because this is a given node. And then this one is actually equal to alpha u1 plus beta u2 plus gamma u3. Of course, alpha, beta, gamma are all function of x, y, right? Because when you change the point to different location, you will have different value of alpha, beta, gamma. And then you have v, x, y equal to alpha, v1 plus beta v2 plus gamma v3. Okay? So this is going to be calculated in the post process. Today we teach and learn post processing step. We only learn 2D. I mean, we only learn 1D actually. So this is how the 2D is conducted because when you know the value on this node, this node, this node. What happens in the middle? Uh, people are making assumption. What happens in the middle is a linear change. So you can find like all this relationship because the error can be calculated by determinant of coordinates, right? So which is a linear manipulation, right? And so basically all these alpha, beta, gamma are linear function in terms of x, y. So I mean, this is a function of x, y. And beta is also a function of x, y. And gamma is a function of x, y. This is because a1 is a function of x, y, right? a2 is also a function of x, y. a3 is a function of x, y. Of course, a total is fixed because the node is fixed. So let's see why this is correct. Let's verify it a little bit. If we have. Uh, say this point, okay, let's say if this point is some point on this edge, okay, that means A2 is always zero, right? When A2 is always zero, I mean this point if you traveled on this edge, A2 is 0, right? Well, A2 is 0, that means beta is 0, right? And so it turns out the combination only becomes alpha and gamma. 
So this point traveled on this edge now becomes a linear combination of value of u1 and u3, the same as what we show here, 1D. Right? Right? OK. And also because gamma, in that scenario, gamma, when beta equal to 0, when we impose this equation, gamma is actually equal to 1 minus alpha, the same as this one. So it's basically uh, one special case when this point travel on this edge, all this formula shown here is converted into a 1D linear interpolation. Okay? And then let's consider about another special case. If two of them are zero, like if beta and gamma are zero, what is it given? Beta and gamma are zero, of course, of this one, alpha equal to one, right? So this one is actually interpolated V1. So beta and gamma are zero is actually like this one and this one, these two areas are zero. That is the case when this point approach to here, right? So this gives you a basic sense about why this is correct. So this is what really happens inside. So FEA, all the distribution are calculated on a mesh. For example, let me simply draw, simply draw some mesh. So values are only calculated on the node. So only the value on the node is precisely given. All things happens in the middle of each triangle are obtained by this so-called by linear interpolation. So you have a special name, it's called piecewise <coughs> linear function. Okay. So basically, oh. so basically, FEA gives you a tessellation of the whole domain and the calculating value on the node. And what happens between the nodes is determined by a piecewise linear function, which is also called, if you go to FEA textbook, it's called shape function. So this is a special name for FEA. So if you go to uh, any of the textbook or reference book, you say, I learned FEA, and then people say, what's the shape function? So shape function actually is like how your, the value is interpolated inside, okay? So for triangular element, you have one shape function. Rectangular element, you have different shape function. And then linear function, linear shape function, and also there are nonlinear shape function. Okay, so if a nonlinear shape function happens inside, you probably need to have a more node this defined inside of each triangle. So here, I would like to come back to the course work. It's like you need to make sure you mesh while you're doing the remeshing. You need to make sure those points which you want to achieve, they are given as a node. Okay, instead of of course, you can obtain their value by interpolation, but now you understand why it's not accurate, because it's somehow like approximated, generated by the linear equation. okay? So this is the first question. And the second question, of course, you are asked to solving a planar scan problem, which is a one dimension, huge, the other two dimension, much smaller compared to this dimension. So this is, uh, uh, second problem, and so probably this gives you the screen capture of the what on the blackboard you can you can have this lab sheet, and then what's going to happen in in the next week? So next week we are going to see how we can model in 3D using ANSYS, but my way is like I don't directly model models. In, in ANSYS, I usually using SOLIDWORKS to model it, and then somehow to trying to export a file from the SOLIDWORKS, import from into ANSYS, and do certain 
minor level of uh, modification and make it able to uh, analyze. Okay. And so uh, next, we will also try to introduce a little bit about real-world FEA-based design problem, not a topology optimization. We'll go for multiple physics. Although now we already learned solid mechanics-oriented FEA, right? But multiple physics is quite similar. The concept similar as what I joined here, like calculating the field value on the node and then apply interpolation inside. <coughs> and then, of course, we're going to finish the third uh, uh, lab about FEA, it's the 3D modeling. And uh, we will not have any of the video ask you to watch before you come to the live lecture next week. So this is quite a little bit more, like less loaded in the coming week, but trying to already make yourself ready for the coursework. So you will have uh, nearly, nearly one week to complete the coursework, slightly more than that, one or two days more than one week, something like that, okay? So any questions? So no questions, I guess that's all for today. Thank you. So the central node when you're doing the triangles, that's, as in that's not a fixed central node, yeah. So that's something node there. Yeah, this node can move. Uh, so that's, that's just to define you. That's all that is is for the point. So it's a general point. Right. So that's the point I want to analyze. Yeah. It's it's, defle it's yeah. deflections effectively. Actually, you see you see the distribution which is visualized to you by software. What happens inside is like they know the value here, here, and here. Those are the ones and we've got. Yeah, there's like naturally they visualize it by many many dots, right? So, so this is just point, one example, yeah, and each one, one will have point. its own a values. Yeah. But when it's along the, when it's actually when you're treating working a longer line, then you're only going to have two or one depending on exactly. And if you're working a longer line, then you only then you're going to have two. If you're on a node, then you'll have one. Right. Because that's, that's right. so. This is on a line, right? Yeah, that'll yeah. be on a line, and that'll yeah. be at a node. Right. When it's because exactly. then that rules out. Other nodes are like these two will become zero, yeah. and then come to here, right? When any of these other two are zero and come to here, right? If uh, these two are zero, it come to here. Can I take a picture of this picture? Yeah, of course. So, for example, if you want to generalize the areas, like how we're going to write the formulas, not for the total area, but for the specific ones. But so we here one is like, oh, let's say we have this one and this two, right? Okay, let's so, say that one. So, so this one, let's say A1, yeah. is actually determinant. So you see, like, every... Every triangle is like from side of this one, so you have one x y, and this one is one x two y two. This one is x three y three. And usually, like the points x and y are somehow in an interval. I'm going to define the interval in order yeah. to so yeah. it's not so that difficult at this point. So this is actually linear linear calculation of everything, right? So this is known, this is also known, and this is function that you want to determine. So basically, you can convert it into a linear function related to x, y. Okay. Yeah, and then you, so every alpha, beta, gamma, uh, something like this. And how do I define the, like, the interval for the x and y? Like, for example, what values I want to put, like, uh, the accurate points, like how many points I'm actually having inside the entire triangle? Oh, you can, you can go to infinity. So I can go yeah. to infinity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in practice, let's say, in order to get an accurate or a list. Uh, no. What do you see on a picture? It's like they're using pixel. It's like how big the picture you want to show there. Right? Okay. So every pixel will, is will convert it to an x, y, and a substitute here to get in value. Okay. Yeah. But you, of course, when you zoom in into the pixel, you zoom in into the picture, you may have more, more pixels. Yeah. But you, you just calculate it on site. That's possible. The other way is like, okay, let's uh, say if this is a triangle, I somehow uh, say, I want to know the value here, for example, and then of course, user specify what is x, y coordinate of the point I want to evaluate. And then you just substitute the x, y into this formula, and you get all the thing. So it could be user input, 
or could be uh, sampled by pixels and could also be related to uh, your engineer requirements. It's just like I want it very dense, like any of the points inside the distance less than a certain requirement. So you just randomly sample the points inside and then as long as go to dense enough, say, okay, that's good enough for me to evaluate. It's always, uh, it's, it's kind of a user required, how, how dense the points should be inside. Yeah, but for visualization, they just using pixel. Yeah, because I mean, I mean, I'm asking because firstly, I have to make like the assumption, right? But after that, I'm going to know how dense it is. Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. So that's that's user specified. As a user, you need to let the software to provide how dense it is inside. Okay. okay. Thank you very okay. much. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask when yeah. you show the optimized designs. Yeah. So there was always a load there. So were they optimized just for the, that one loading condition? Yeah. Or? So, good question. <laughs> I, I, can, I, I did not have enough time to, to finish that part. So, it's very important, like, uh, if you have a fixed loading. So, that is called fixed loading based uh, uh, optimization. And there's another possible optimization, it's like uncertain loading based. So, they just uh, generate a random loading and then try to find out the worst scenario. So that's called worst case optimization. And some of people do research, um, it's like, it's a calculating probability of what, what is the pro probability of this load is going to ap apply there. And then they're choosing the maximum possible direction. So there's so many of this kind of uh, change. We call it a variant, like, like COVID variant, right? So it's a, it's a variant of our original solution of uh, topology optimization but it all depends on this core. So it's like, you need to somehow adding the outer loop of your optimization to try different combinations, different possibilities, but still you can program it. Okay. Yeah. So it doesn't always have to be this one. Yeah, uh, it's not always have to have given one, but it's like, some, let's say the loading is a boundary condition. So you can change your boundary condition. And you can also optimize the boundary condition, right? So it's like, what is the best boundary condition I can get in the best result? So Something like that. Okay. Right, thank, thank you. Thank you. So could you explain what is truncation error? Okay, truncation, and yeah. Yeah, why does, if error one becomes so small, uh, the computer, the okay. truncation So if like, error I will, my calculation want to describe a value of uh, one over by three. Yeah. Okay. This is uh, infinite length number, right? Yeah. But in computer, there's no way you can store this. Of course, there's some special way you can store this. So in, in computer, you always uh, store a decimal number. Uh, decimal number is frequency yeah. number, so basically you have this, this, this. But you, you should stop somewhere. The program will automatically stop somewhere. Is that the 10 to the minus five? Yeah. So all the rest, there are many, many threes, right? Yeah. All this will disappear if you save a number of this to a computer. Because if you write a MATLAB code, you define a variable, it have a limited length of a precision. So every number inside of computer is not precise. All this actually gone. You don't store it. So if you, if you L1 is one over by three, and now you, using some uh, delta L over by L1, give you the strand. Yeah. All this will gone. Oh. So what do you, the strand, what do you calculate in half this, one over this as the arrow there? Oh, so if L1 right. becomes too small, yeah. the arrow mm -hmm. is actually some very kind big, of big, right. big Relatively big becomes very big. Yeah. And then so it turns out, this is what we call truncation arrow dominates the whole calculation because the, the, the result you obtain will never accurate. Of course, there are some of the tricky way you can solve this. Just like, okay, maybe I using, uh, there's a, a type of variable called double, I mean double decimal. So it turns out, okay, now I only store seven and then we can go have another seven. But no matter how for this value, you still always have a truncation error, right? Because this, this is some value which is a fractal number can never be precisely described by a decimal. 
so there, right now, there is no no way to solve this quest question. Uh, there is a way. It's like we store both this and this, oh. right? And then we always represent every number by a rational number of two integers. But turns out all the calculation needs to be plus or minus. Uh, multiply, divide, if you convert it into this uh, fractal number calculation. And then there's no way to calculate in square root for this. So there's a still always some, ch some chance that you have a truncation error happen, oh. right? right? Thank you. Yeah, so this is a fundamental problem of all the numerical calculation. Just uh, remember, like, computer is precise, but not always precise. So these are some of the problems. Uh, in this example, like, right. um, but when he plot the uh, move circle, he used um. Uh, you mean Glenn? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He used uh, minus seventy for the total x y, but I don't really understand why he's doing minus. Okay. Like for this one, it should be um uh, sigma x s and tau x y, right? But um. So this, this is what uh, what what we have, right? So we have yes. uh, we have. Uh, so you have a 2D case. So if this is sigma x, this is uh, sigma y, right? Yes. So you have a tau x y here, and you have a tau x y here, right? Uh, yes. Okay. So basically, let's see how we did. So this is sigma, this is tau. So you can using this one point. So this is uh, uh, sigma x and tau x y. And then, of course, you can use this as another point, so then same height, right? Mm. So this is sigma, sigma y, tau x y, right? Mm. So for this two points, you can also get in a mirror copy of these two. So, so this is a tau y minus tau x y, that's sigma y minus tau x y, right? So this one, you also get in a mirror copy of this one. So this is sigma x. So all these points are located on the circle. Oh. So we just using this one and this one to find out the center and draw, right? Yes. So this is how he did. It's like they uh, use they picking this too. Yeah, I understand this, but but he used the point um, sigma x and minus tau x y in this point. Um, I think I don't really understand why he used minus. Right? I, I don't want to say either. Oh, <laughs> so, okay, so just just follow this one. Oh, then you'll oh, get it, right? Oh, so oh, okay. you know this point. This point is a half of uh, sigma x of uh, sigma y, right? So oh. this is right zero. Oh, I understand. Yeah. Apparently. So I think the, he 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 hides something there. I'm, I'm not really follow what oh. what he did. Why why he mess? Mm. I, I think he has something wrong. It should be square, right? Uh, oh yes, exactly. Yeah. So the, here have a tau x y square. Mm. Yeah, is it better? Oh, so you can understand? Yeah, I understand. Like it won't influence the in the solution, but mm, uh. this like this uh, lens. It's like this one minus this one times two times of this actually, square, and then you get in the, the circle, right? You you yeah. need to calculate distance of this two, yeah. and then somehow like that. Okay. But now it's better, right? You yes, understand yes, what I happens? Understand. So it's like this two point you mirror copy, so you have four points actually. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me look out. Uh, my um, computer cluster is uh, five. Uh, yes, uh, I mean a uh, Friday, but um, I have like pretty much lectures and tutorials on Friday. Can I switch it to like Thursday? You can, but you you give her a strong reason, and this copy email to me and Amy. Uh, I will approve. Uh, I will approve. See. But you need to justify why you need to do that. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> see, because just like too yeah, many just lectures. send me send me some uh, send me email. Let's uh, have a record. Okay, right. Cool. Okay. I I would like to shift it to. Thursday section, and then we'll check with, with whether there will be an available slot. But I, probably, I think we have so 
we have place, right? Okay. So don't worry Thank about you. it. Okay, just but me and you just send me email. Okay. So I have a problem with the trust example from two weeks ago. Yeah? Uh, so what's your name? I'm Sean. I know him. Yeah, yeah I'm Sean. Sean, how do you find him? Sean. My, my name. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm just trying to um, uh, Sean, 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 Sean yeah. Tao. Yeah. Tao. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, Tao is a Chinese name? Uh, actually, it's Liao is a surname. Sean Tao is a Chinese name. Yes. Sean Tao is a surname. Oh, Liao. Yeah, Liao. Liao Xian Tao. Oh, this Liao. Yes. So you from Hong Kong? No, I'm from Singapore. Singapore. Oh, I yes. see. I see. Yeah, this is not uh, not Taiwan. Taiwan is Li. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ty it's not Taiwan, it's not the mainland. So, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you're yeah. from Singapore, nice. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I've got this trust example from two weeks back. Yeah. So it's that um, for rotation matrix, P and P inverse is the same. But yeah. when I put in the values for P and P inverse, right, actually the negative signs are different. So for example, in the first column of the second row, P is positive here, then negative here, positive here, negative here. So it's like that to transfer. Huh? Uh, no, that's the inverse. Yeah, in both inverse and P is equal to transfer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah, it's for rotation matrix. Transfer from P. Yeah. Transpose. Transfer is mirror copy. Oh, okay, okay. Mirror copy of the diagonal. I see. That's called transfer. Yeah, okay, then I think I've seen something wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so that is the. Uh, T, mirror copy of T, right? Oh, yes. Mirror to the diagonal, that's transpose. Yeah. Okay, um, so that's what, how it's, uh, this, 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 actually these two shapes, these two shapes. Yeah. Okay. Then, um, for, uh, so I tried an example, which is basically a copy of this inside the week two lab sheet. Yeah. Uh, I got the answer for the first one, but using the wrong, well, sometimes the wrong method uh, can give you the right answer. <laughs> yeah, but, okay, now, now, now that I've got this cleared out, I think I'll try it again. But yeah. I actually posted a question on the online discussion board. So oh, really? I maybe, I can, uh, maybe I can check. Well, you, 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 what's the title you use? Uh, I think it's the first first question, it's the latest one. If you related to the coursework for lab, lab class and Amy will answer. 
So it's not an additional boundary condition that is. When you, when you say having socket with the momentum, and then you are treated as a beam. As a truss. Yeah. 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 If you, if you treat it as a, as a spur element, so basically you ignore all those cases. You can still use a hand in socket, but you greatly simplify the figure model. Because if you ignore moments, you have two different set of answers. So 